Hello, my name is Richard Decal from Dendra Systems, and thank you for the invitation to give this talk. I'm excited to tell you today about how we use Ray and AnyScale to scale up our machine learning on aerial imagery. Our species has dedicated a tremendous amount of ingenuity and money to resource extraction. And as, uh, as a consequence, the rate of ecological destruction we're seeing today has never before been seen in our history. This, as, as well as uh, climate change, has resulted in 2 billion hectares of degraded land. That, in turn, has caused a bunch of cascading effects, such as political upheaval, wildfires, and mass extinction events. In contrast, the ecological restoration rates are nowhere near uh, the same, and the traditional methods of ecological restoration do not scale. So... To give you a few examples, for ecosystem analytics, unfortunately, there are some things that satellite imagery and plane imagery cannot do at that resolution. For example, you can't look at grass from plane imagery and tell if it's uh, one species or another. So for that, you really need um, either ultra high resolution imagery or people on the ground. Another uh, uh, example is invasive weed monitoring. Typically, this is done with a person driving around on a truck and trying to spot weeds. And this is very uh, error prone, it's not comprehensive and uh, not ideal. The third thing is ecosystem restoration. Now, this tends to be very manual and have little automation or it's optimized for a monoculture. So if you're wondering why we can't just take tractors out into the wild, they to, tend to be very top heavy and they'll flip over if there's a bit of an incline and they're uh, typically used for monoculture. And all of these fail in places like cliffs where uh, you just, it's not, uh, 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 you can't go with a machine or on foot. So here's where Dendra is coming in to build scalable ecosystem restoration. And we use a, a variety of tools. We, we use a lot of drones to do ultra high resolution mapping at an unprecedented scale. We can then use machine learning to analyze that imagery and derive insights. And after we could use other drones that are specialized for uh, seeding. Now, the advantages of this is that we're much faster and cheaper than traditional methods and we're more robust, more targeted, safer. All around, we, we do better than the traditional methods. Now, I'm gonna quickly gloss over our suite of products. Um, we do things like biodiversity assessments and, and biodiversity report cards. We can uh, uh, quantify uh, tree stem density and native species to, to understand how the re rehabilitation is going. In addition to uh, finding animals and seeing if they're starting to repopulate areas that were blighted before. We find uh, migratory routes to understand how animals are, are moving around in the area. And in addition, we can also find pests and weeds and help our customers prioritize which areas need interventions. We can find things that are uh, uh, that need to be cleaned up before we can uh, clean the land for, for ecosystem restoration. And finally, we can monitor erosion and, and soil health so we could find areas that may be dangerous to move on because uh, they're, they're, they have an imminent collapse. We can find places where topsoil is likely to get washed away or desertification. And we can prevent things before they get too expensive to, to treat down the line. And finally, we could all do this on a massive scale. A single drone can, in a single day, capture 400 soccer fields worth of imagery. And in addition to be able to monitor these area, areas, we could also take action. We have seeding drones that every single one can deploy two polar bears in weight worth of seeds in a single day. These seeds, by the way, it are can be tailored mixtures of over 50 species as opposed to monoculture. And uh, a, a single pilot can fly multiple drones in a swarm, and 10 of these drones can plant as many as 300,000 trees in a day. So this is much more than you and I can hope to plant in a single day on our own. 
So taking a step back, a little bit about me. I'm a machine learning engineer. I'm dedicated to fighting climate change. And in a past life, I was a molecular biologist. I was the first machine learning hire at Dendra. I founded the team and I was tasked with building out our machine learning platform. So this is our platform. We uh, uh, have all the usual suspects. And as you can see, Ray and Anyscale, the, their ecosystem is pretty uh, big in our, in our platform. And this speaks to the fact that it's a very versatile platform. And I want to emphasize that I am not a computer scientist or a distributed systems expert. I do have experience with MapReduce and PySpark, but I never thought that I would be able to do all of this stuff in a year, given my, my background. So Ray really helped with um, uh, increasing my leverage, so to speak. So this also serves as a map of my talk. I'm going to talk about uh, these different things, except for the feature engineering. I won't go into that other than to say we use Ray fairly extensively in our computing. And uh, I do think that Ray core is much more pleasurable to use than uh, Python's built-in multiprocessing. It's easier to code, easier to read, and uh, easier to maintain. And it also has the added benefit that it is capable of scaling to multiple machines. Unlike uh, Python's multiprocessing that could only scale vertically, you could also scale horizontally if that's something that you need. So I'm going to go ahead and, and jump into the uh, model training part of my talk. So when I first got hired at Dendra, I got started on AWS SageMaker. And I do like SageMaker if you need to uh, bootstrap from zero. Uh, they have a lot of off-the-shelf templated solutions that you could just you know, hit the ground running with. However, for us, we had already an in-house platform and we needed to have specialized models and the cookie cutter templates really weren't flexible enough for us to use. So I, looking, I started looking at alternatives and I found Raytune and I'm glad that I did. It was very easy to adopt. I, I ported my, Ray, my PyTorch code to RaySGD uh, fairly simply and what this gives us is the ability to scale from a single replica on my local machine to dozens of GPUs on the clouds without changing any code. So that's that's a big win. And another win is that Raytune in the long run has saved us lots of money um, due to a few features that it has. So in this image, the x-axis is time and the y-axis is loss, where the higher up this is, the worse the, the performance of the model is. And each one of these different traces is a different trial with a different hyperparameter um, configuration. So one thing that Raytune does is it has schedulers that can aggressively terminate underperforming trials instead of letting them uh, train to completion. And uh, one estimate is that if we were to have done this same exact hyperparameter tournament with without this, we would have paid, uh, spent around $20,000. Instead, we spent less than $4,000. So a, a major win. And these, uh, uh, since these are terminated early, it becomes pretty cheap to sample a larger hyperparameter space. So this is useful if we're training a new architecture or if we've made major changes to the model or the, the processing and we want to try to find it's kind of a global optima, um, we, we can afford to sample in a larger space and then do a course to find search uh, using this trial resuming. So I really like Raytune. If you're not using it, I, I recommend giving it a shot. Um, the second thing that we used Ray for is inference and, and model serving. So our requirements, our ma main requirement was scale. We wanted a solution that could scale to hundreds of millions of images in our future, which we're projected to hit in just a few years, given our, our growth rates. And we wanted to be able to split this work across many workers on a, um, in a cluster. The second thing we wanted to do was maximize the GPU utility across the culture, uh, a cluster, to get the most bang for our buck, except, uh, essentially. So... Initially, I was having trouble with uh, network I.O. as a bottleneck. So I'm going to talk to you about how I got around that and was able to saturate our GPUs. So this is a rough sketch of our inference pipeline. These dotted lines are different machines on the cluster. And these gray 
boxes are ray actors. So briefly, we have a ray uh, actor queue, and this queue has a bunch of images that we want results for. So we farm out these URLs to different worker nodes, and the S3 clients on these nodes, they, they fetch images off of S3. Those images then get batched and put on model replicas, and the results of those models get streamed out to AWS Kinesis Firehose for post-processing, batching, sharding, partitions, all that good stuff, and they get saved as parquet shards on S3. So the main thing I want to draw attention to is how I uh, uh, architected these S3 client actors. Basically, I had them so that they are initialized inside of the Ray serve actor as the, the serve actor gets, uh, gets initialized. So as these replicas are created and the cluster is elastically scaling either up or down, so too are the clients being scaled up or down. And these clients are co-located with the model replicas. So that minimizes the amount of traffic that is crossing uh, across these workers. These clients can directly serve to the model replica that is on the same machine. And so that gives us a scaling of our clients with the cluster size. And a second thing that I did was making these client actors work with eager evaluation rather than lazy evaluation. So with lazy evaluation, Ray basically doesn't do work until that work, the, the result is necessary. And so when I did the first, um, version of this, what I would see is that the, C the GPU utility would spike up while the network utility would go quiet. Once the model would flush out its results, it would request the images, the next batch of images, and only then would the client say, oh, okay, I better fetch those off of S3. The, the network usage would then spike up and the model replica would be quiet while I was waiting for that. So they were alternating between doing work. By instead making this eager evaluation, the network is constantly in use. It's constantly downloading images, whether or not the model is ready at that point. And so as the model is flushing um, results out, there's images that are ready to the next batch of images are ready. So this has uh, made it so that we can use the most GPU possible and we're constantly using our network across the entire cu cluster evenly. Next, I wanted to talk about why we became AnyScale customers. Um, there's a few deficiencies in Ray that uh, made it so that we couldn't do the things that we uh, I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides. So Ray has uh, uh, problems with uh, programmatic controls of the cluster. Namely, you have to use the CLI and you could use OS sub process call, but it's a very clunky way of dealing with the clusters. And AnyScale solved, solves this with their SDK, which makes it really easy and, and convenient to set up clusters, check their status, execute things on them, shut them down, whatever, whatever you want to do with a cluster, you could do it uh, very easily. Um, the second thing is the uh, performance. Sometimes uh, uh, with Ray, um, you want to be able to hot start clusters instead of having to wait 20, 30, 40 minutes for all the nodes to run through all the setup steps. So the way we were getting around this with Ray was having a bunch of uh, EC2 nodes that are in a stop state. And then we could hot start those, those uh, instances, but we're still being charged for those. And it wasn't very robust. If we, if we changed the settings or made major changes to the repository, we'd have to destroy all their nodes and start them up again uh, and, and rerun the whole setup step all over again. We also uh, were fixed in size. You couldn't do elastic scaling with those stop nodes. Um, and as an alternative, we could have created a uh, continuous deploy, deployment pipeline with Docker. This should say a CD pipeline. Um, but uh, instead, we saw that with AnyScale, it does automatic managing of our application images and abstracts away all of the dockerization and, and does all the image management for us. So I'll give you a few ideas of how we use this to solve some problems that we, we were having. So one of the problems we were having was that our Bitbucket CI pipelines did not support 
GPU usage. They, the machines that they provision us only have CPUs. So we couldn't do things like test our training and inference infrastructure. And we had a few incidents where we had some silent failures introduced into our repository. And when it was time to do inference, we couldn't do it. So, um, and the way that we used to have to, to uh, mitigate this was we would do all these manual testing whenever we had to um, merge a new pull request into the uh, master branch. And that, that wasn't great. So the goal was to be able to uh, set up machines with GPUs and run these tests and do things like sanity checks that, that our model can overfit on a single image and things like that to give us confidence that our code was working correctly. So this is what it looks like uh, when whenever we push to Bitbucket, the pipelines would get activated as usual and the AnyScale SDK would create a app config. It'll compile a build. And if that passes, then we use AnyScale to start a, a session with GPUs on them and run our tests to see if they pass. And then this, these results get propagated back to uh, Bitbucket's CI. Um, the way this looks like, this is uh, Bitbucket right here. And when everything is passing and the tests are passing, you get the, the uh, results right here in, in Bitbucket and you could see that everything passed. If instead you have failing tests, it'll tell you right here, uh, it'll give us a link to the, to the session. And then you go there and you could see all the log outputs. You can share that session with your colleagues to do some troubleshooting. And similarly, if you have a failing build, it'll give you a, a similar image to this. I couldn't find an example of, of this because it's very rare. Uh, basically, it could happen if you make a mistake in your setup steps or if you introduce mistakes into your requirements.txt file. Um, so, th so this has been great. It has made our systems much more robust and uh, prevented any catastrophic failures from happening. It could catch them early. Another thing I wanted to talk to you is programmatically standing up clusters and running jobs on them. So the issue we were having is if we needed, say, batch inference done on a new mapping job, my colleague would message me and say, hey, we need this. And this could be slow. You could imagine with uh, different time zones, there's a, a bit of a, a turnaround time. And sometimes clusters would take a long time due to the many setup uh, dependencies that, that would go into it. So it was tedious, slow, and error prone. And what we wanted was to have all of our different systems able to talk to each other through APIs and microservices to keep everything decoupled and make it so that other teams don't really have to understand uh, what, what we're building. They could treat it as a black box and just fetch results and not have to understand what we're doing. So this is what that looks like. It, when users are using our platform and say that they want model predictions for a certain area given a certain type of model, they can go the 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 system itself will talk to the microservice and uh, request those results the microservice then will go to any scale and fetch a pre-built app config that was passing from our production branch and then it could using that pre-built config it could hot start in just a couple of minutes a session and hit the ground running instead of uh, having to go through all the setup steps on each node individually and then Inference works like I showed you before, saves everything on S3, and a webhook alert can then go talk to this um, system and say, hey, the results are ready, and that system can load them right in there. So this takes a human out of the, the loop and automates uh, uh, this, this tedious task. So this is something that we're uh, hoping to get ready for Ray 1.4 release. So in conclusion, Raytune has enabled us to conduct hyperparameter hyperparameter tournaments at scale. We're able to search larger spaces because we can terminate the trials that aren't useful. And RayServe has feature-proofed our inference pipelines, and we can do any job from 10,000 images to 100 million images without having to change our, our underlying infrastructure. Now, AnyScale SDK has been very nice. It has enabled us to test mission-critical pieces of our platform and prevent uh, or find 
failures before they become integrated into our production pipelines. And finally, Raycore is very nice. I recommend it to everyone, even if they're not a machine learning person. It's nicer to use than uh, Python's multiprocessing and can scale out to many machines. It's also friendlier, I think, than PySpark. Anyone that has worked with PySpark may have experience having to debug JVM stack traces, which you know they're they're a little bit painful. Raycore is all in Python, which which is very nice, and it uh, uh, lets lets you do horizontal scaling in addition to vertical scaling. So that's all I have uh, for everyone today. I hope you found this talk helpful. And I'd like to give a big shout out to the whole AnyScale team. They've been very wonderful with me, uh, always giving me advice on Slack and getting me unstuck whenever I have questions. So thank you all for all the great work that you do. We are on um, social media if you want to follow us. And here's our website. And I'm happy to take some questions.